So at age 12, um, it was during a church service, uh, the pastor invited uh, anyone who wanted to be saved um, and go to heaven and have everlasting life to pray along with him. Um, and so I, I prayed the sinner's prayer with him. Um, and at that moment, I believed that I was a Christian, and that I was going to heaven. Um, truthfully, I wasn't. Um, I wasn't serious about God. I didn't, I, I didn't even read the Bible unless it was like in church or something like that. I never really cared to understand what God wants from me. Uh, I was too busy with, you know, video games, girls, uh, movies, and things like that. It wasn't until age 17 that I actually got serious about God and actually got uh, wanting to know what the Bible says and wanting to serve God. And what I began to find is I would read this in the Bible and then I'd go to my church and they wouldn't be teaching that. I read this in the Bible and I would see everyone else isn't teaching that or isn't believing that. It wasn't until I opened up the Bible and start reading what it says that I realized that I wasn't a true Christian, that I wasn't following what God wanted me to follow. In Matthew chapter 7, it says there are going to be people who are going to stand before God and they're going to call him Lord, they're going to call him Master. But really, Jesus is going to say to them that he does not know them. And the fact is, you may claim that you're a Christian, but the thing is, if you are not examining yourself according to Scripture, according to the words of Jesus, according to the words of the Bible, you may stand before God on Judgment Day and he may command you to depart. And I know for me personally, if I had not read these passages in the Bible, I could still have been a fake Christian, believing I was a Christian, but really on my way to hell. So I hope that you will take the time to finish this film till the end, and that you will examine these verses yourself to see if you are in the faith. So I was taught that once we got saved, that we should try to live a Christ-like life, meaning trying not to sin, trying to be righteous in this life, just striving for perfection, uh, to be as much as we can like Christ as possible. But we would never be sinless in this life, but we should still try to be, is what I was taught. But then, I picked up the Bible and I started reading it. And I came across 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, which says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. So let's take a look at this passage a little more in depth here, all right? It says, There have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. So that part right there, he will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. You're never going to be tempted to sin above what you are capable of handling. There's never going to be a temptation too strong that you can't resist it. It will not happen. God will not allow it. And then it says, But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. So with that temptation to sin, which you are capable of handling, God provides a way to escape that temptation, so that way you can bear it and you can escape the temptation and obey God. So the church taught me that you can't be sinless, you can't resist sin, and you will continue to sin till the day you die. But what did we just read in the passage? that there's no temptation too strong 
that you are not capable of handling, that you can resist. And with each temptation, God has provided a way to escape it so that way you won't sin, so that way you can live a sinless life that is pleasing to God. Now, don't get me wrong. We can't be sinless unless God first forgives us and we're cleansed from our sin. But once we have been forgiven by God, what is stopping us from obeying God? There is nothing. There's no temptation too strong that's making you sin. And God is always providing that way of escape for you so you can stop sinning. You're always given the two options. You have the choice to sin and the choice not to sin. It's a free choice. You can choose to take God's way of escape or you can choose to not resist temptation, to give in to temptation and to sin against God. Not only that, but we actually see throughout the Bible that there were people who lived sinless lives, who were perfect, and who were righteous. Let me give you a few examples here. Job 1, verses 1 and 8. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And then verse 8, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. So there we see straight from scripture that Job was a perfect man. And even God speaks to Satan, says, look at my servant Job. There is not a single man on the earth like him. He is a perfect man. We see in Genesis 6 verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. So we see from Genesis 6 verse 9 that Noah was a perfect man. He was a just man. And that makes sense why he was saved. He was saved from the flood because he was obeying God and everyone else was judged by God and destroyed because they were wicked and sinful. God saved the righteous man and he destroyed the wicked. Luke 1 verses 5 through 6 says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. So there we see Zacharias and Elizabeth, that they were both righteous before God. Before God's eyes, they were both righteous, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. How could they do that? Because there is no temptation to sin too strong for them to resist. And they chose, with their free will, to obey God. Luke 23, 50 says, And behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just So there we see that the Bible says Joseph was a good man. I know what you might be thinking. You might think Romans 3, and you might be thinking Matthew 19, where the Bible says there is none good, no, not one. Oh, there is none righteous, no, not one. And yes, that is true. But once God has forgiven us, what's stopping you from being righteous? What's stopping you from living a holy life? I mean, if we have a choice to sin or not to sin, we can live a sinless life. Yes, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, as Romans 3.23 says. But the key is all have sinned. Have is past tense. We all have done it. But it's nothing stopping you right now from living a sin-free life. This is not the only thing that the church has deceived millions on. There is much more. And I'm going to be sharing more of that coming up. So we've learned that the Bible says that we can be sinless and that we are able to overcome every temptation to sin. But what happens if a Christian goes off and commits sin? It says in Ezekiel 18, verse 24, But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. 
So we see that the righteous man, the man who's been forgiven by God, if he goes off and commits sin or iniquity and does according to the wicked, will he still live? Will he still be saved? It says all the righteousness that he has is not going to be mentioned anymore. It's gone. And in his sins, he shall die. The consequences of sinning against God is losing our right standing with God. It says in Hebrews 10, verse 26, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, it says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. It says in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murderers, drunkenness, revilings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. One more here, Revelation 21, 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So it is completely obvious from Scripture that those who are committing those sins will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is not talking about committing multiple sins and not inheriting the kingdom of God. It takes one lie to be a liar. It takes one act of adultery to be an adulterer. It takes one act of fornication to be a fornicator, and so on. There will be no sinners in heaven, only former sinners. Let's take a look at another passage that proves that our actions have an effect on our salvation. Matthew 6, 14 through 15. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So if you forgive others, God will forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, God's not going to forgive you. If you're a Christian and you choose not to forgive someone, then God's going to choose not to forgive you anymore. It says in 1 John 3, 8 through 9, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. There we see clearly, if you commit sin, you're of the devil. If you're born of God, you do not commit sin. Isaiah 59, 1-2 through two, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. There we see clearly that it is your sins that separate you from God. You can't be a sinner and with God. God is separate from sinners. And he doesn't even hear your prayers if you're a sinner. Romans 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death. That applies to unbelievers just as much as to believers. If you commit sin, the wages will be death. You're not going to get away with sinning and still getting to go to heaven. The wages of sin is death. If you commit sin, you lose your right standing with God, and you will be cast into the lake of fire. So we've learned in the last two videos that number one, 
we can be sinless and that we can resist temptation and live a sinless life here on earth. And number two, that sin affects our salvations. That if we sin, as the Bible says, we'll be of the devil and that we will lose our salvation. And finally, number three, which is salvation is by holiness. It says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew 5, verse 20, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Follow peace with all men, and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. So the scriptures make it clear, without holiness, without purity, without righteousness, you will not enter into heaven, you will not see the Lord. So we must become righteous, we must become holy, and the Bible tells us how to do that. Matthew 19, verse 17, And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Luke 10, 25 through 28. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. That is the message we hear from Jesus. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. To love God and to love our neighbor. Jesus said, do this and thou shalt live. If you look up the word faith in the Strong's Concordance, you will see that faith means belief, confidence, faithfulness, and fidelity. So yes, faith is the belief in believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, but it also is faithfulness and fidelity to God. It is being faithful to God and keeping his commandments. If we actually take a look at scripture, we can see that the opposite of belief is to not obey. It says in John 3.36 in the ESV, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. There we see the opposite of believe is to not obey. We also see in 1 Peter 2, Verse 7, Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient. The stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Not only the Strong's Concordance, but these two verses make it clear the opposite of belief is to not obey. Faith, obedience, they are synonyms. This then makes sense of what Jesus meant in Luke 6 verse 46. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? And isn't that true? Don't people love to call Jesus their Lord and love to call him Master? When really they're not obeying him. He's not really their Lord because if Jesus is the Lord of their life, that means they must obey the Lord. They must be following him. Why are you calling Jesus Lord if you're not doing the things which he says, which he commands? Acts 5 verse 32, And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Here we see that the Holy Ghost is given to those that obey God. Acts 10, 34 through 35, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Here we see Peter telling us that we must fear God and work righteousness in order to be accepted by God. Not just believe in your head, it is to fear God and to work righteousness, to be accepted by God. 
Hebrews 5, 9, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. 1 John 1, verses 6 through 7, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Now let's take a very close look at this First John passage, because a lot of people will claim that, well, if you have to do something for your salvation, then what's the purpose of Jesus? Why did Jesus die on the cross? If we can be sinless, then why did Jesus have to die? And this verse clarifies that for us. When we choose to serve God and to walk in righteousness or walk in the light as he is in the light, that is when the blood of Jesus washes our sins away. Because if you just simply only obeyed God, and you never were washed from your previous sins, well, you're still guilty. If you go off and commit sin and choose not to commit sin the rest of your life, you still have that stain on your record. It needs to be washed and cleansed. It even says in the Bible that Jesus came to save us from sin. That's Matthew 1, 21. So that blood of Jesus, it washes away our sins and cleanses us when we choose to follow God and walk in righteousness. Romans 2, 13. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. James 2 verse 24, Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Revelation 22 14, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. Proverbs 28, verse 13 and verse 18. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Whoso walketh uprightly shall be saved, but he that is perverse in his ways shall fall at once. There is no covering for your sins. You are not hiding behind the righteousness of Christ and he doesn't see you. You must confess your sins to God and you must forsake them you'll have mercy. You must walk uprightly in order to be saved. Don't be deceived by the church's lies. We must forsake sin and leave it behind, never to be repeated again, and to live a holy and righteous life before God, serving Him in obedience. There is still much more deception that is going on within the church. And you might have questions concerning what you've just heard. And we encourage you to visit our YouTube channel at One Reality and also our website, theylied.org, where we answer your questions and study further on these subjects and others. If you've watched this film and know it to be the truth, please help us with sharing this video to as many people as possible so that the whole world might be able to hear the truth. Thank you for taking the time to watch this film and remain faithful to God's commands.